This is Adam here for Powit.tv and Sailor Moon News. We're here with John Stalker. Hi, John. How are you? Thanks for this. We're here at Fan Expo in Toronto. Uh, John Stalker is sort of a legend in the uh, voice acting industry. He's also done some Sailor Moon stuff, which is one of the reasons why I want to talk to him today. Um, Sailor Moon, what kind of stuff did you work on for the Sailor Moon show? Well, I did a lot of bits and pieces uh, as a voice actor. I'm still a voice actor. Uh, and um, one day the producer, who was a little bit of a... I'm going to be politically correct here. A bit, a bit of a kook fired the voice director that they uh, she'd been using for I think a couple of years, and asked me, turned to me, and said, "Would you like to be my new voice director on Sailor Moon?" Uh, I said, "Yeah, okay." And uh, that was a turning point in my life and my career. And for the next two years, did two seasons of Sailor Moon voice directing as well as a couple of little, again, a couple of bits and pieces in the acting uh, end of things. And then I did the movieettes and movieolas, and, and then it all came to a crashing halt. So was that one of the first voice directing jobs you'd done? It was the first voice directing job. I'd never even considered it. Uh, it wasn't on the radar. Uh, glad I did it, though. I mean, the writing was kind of on the wall, not that my voice career was deteriorating in any way. But I knew that there had to be something beyond voice work. Uh, all, the, all the guys and gals riding the crest, at some point, you're not the flavor of the week or the month of the year or the decade. Things change. You've got to expand, especially in Canada. You've got to be really versatile. And I saw that as uh, an opportunity presenting itself, a golden opportunity. Glad I did it. Very cool. Now, I noticed when I looked up your credits, uh, there was mention a lot of you working on the later seasons and doing some bit voices in the later seasons, but when I watch the show, I certainly recognize your voice in some of the early episodes in bit parts. Um, I recognize your voices sounding like Beastly and others from other shows. So can you tell me about how you got to maybe doing some of those other voices on Sailor Moon in the earlier seasons? Well, in the earlier seasons, I was called in to do... I had a couple of moderately large roles, but I never had a running role that went for... Any more than a couple of uh, episodes, but I was called in as like the fill-in guy. I'd come in and I'd do, uh, you know, man one, guy on street, doctor, uh, man on horse, uh, and uh, with the pay scale being the way it is for dubbing, which is different than original voice, uh, production companies can hire you to do five voices and still pay you the line or hourly rate so that they could call me in, being the versatile guy that I was, they could call me in and have me do several voices for each episode, still pay me the same rate. So it paid to be as versatile, as flexible as I was. All of those one-off lines, uh, very few of them are credited because they're not considered major roles or even minor roles. They are just, it's almost fill. But it got me to do a lot of work and hey, you know, the checks didn't bounce, and uh, uh, I got paid for it. So that was basically how that happened. Well, cool. Yeah, I mean, when listening to it, I definitely sort of spotted your iconic voice, and maybe we'll throw in a couple clips of some of uh, the ones in there. You wanted to talk to me, sir? Yes, I did. Tell me why we're getting all this fan mail for a program we don't have. There must be some mistake. Obviously. Now find out what's going on. Good, 200 more. Uh, hey, guys, you all right? What? what happened to you guys? I'm feeling woozy. Other shows you've worked on, uh, Care Bears, uh, Beastly, that's a huge character. How is that? Well, Beastly's probably my most iconic character. I'm probably most recognized for it. Uh, down here, uh, I sell... I sell down here, by the way. Uh, I, I get more requests for Beastly. Uh, picks, uh, signed picks. I also get more, certainly, it dwarfs the next closest in terms of having people come up to me and say, oh, would you do Beastly's laugh for me, please? I grew up on Beastly, please. So, and that's great. That's a good kick. And it's nice. Beastly will live on, uh, I suspect, long beyond me. Uh, it was done 25 or 30 years ago now. And uh, still, uh, hey, his head looks like mine. Uh, still, uh, still going strong. And... Uh, it's nice, as I say, I still get the residual checks, I can't knock that. So when it plays on TV, you still get money for that? I still do, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, to be honest, I mean, that's what performers do. He can't do it for the love. Woody Allen said years ago, uh, you know, if we did it just for the pleasure, 
we call it show show, but it's not. It's show business. So you gotta love it, but you gotta know that you're gonna make some money from it too. I noticed, and this may this may tie in, uh, you know, CanCon rules and stuff like that. I know Canadian channels had to play a certain amount of Canadian shows, but like there are certain shows that you're in that I found Global would just play sort of all the time. Care Bears. Um, uh, down here Ewoks. Yeah. yeah, there you go. There's, well, I'm Teddy right. Ruck's been a bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of shows like that. Uh, My Pet Monster. I don't know if you're in that. So, so you get a lot. Do you find you get a lot of residuals? Because that just kind of just plays on Saturdays all the time. Uh, yeah, I do. You know, once a year, or once every couple of years, there'll be a bunch. Uh, I mean, I did. Uh, uh, I mean, I truly, I've done such an enormous. And I'm, you know, all ego aside, I've. I have an enormous body of work. I sometimes get residuals from things. I have no idea what they are. Sometimes the names are changed after I do them. So, I mean, a check will come in. It'll be uh, sometimes, you know, $6.37. Uh, and some of them are substantially more. The ones that have a, a heavy run, uh, Droids and Ewoks, yeah. is still run fairly regularly uh, because it's part of the Star Wars uh, bundle. Mmm, I don't know. It looks kind of spooky. Yeah! Um, Care Bears, yes. Teddy Ruxman, I got, you know, I get occasionally. Uh, Dog City. A lot of them, though, are, they come and they go. So I don't know if you heard. There's going to be a new Sailor Moon show next summer. Um, I guess there's no real news about you know who's going to dub that or anything like that. Would that be something you'd be interested in working on or anything you've heard about? Well, I've heard about it. I've, I've heard about Houston. I don't know if that's true. Uh, if it's done in the states, they won't hire me. It's simply a, just a, a, a citizenship issue. Uh, and also, there's so little loyalty. I mean, they they, they did um, they did a, a Care Bears. Uh, a new season of Care Bears where they used a new Beastly. Uh, I've been told he's it's lousy. Well, yeah. Beastly! Grumpy? What's a Care Bear doing out here? And, um, you know, they, they could have used me. I mean, with voice patching today or, or uh, simply uh, Skyping. I, I, when I do voice recordings with people in, at a distance, Skype it at the, from the other studio, they send the file. It's really easy, but there isn't a great deal of loyalty. It's uh, bottom line's the dollar, and uh, if they feel that there's not enough loyalty to the original Beastly, or enough time perhaps has elapsed, yeah. that uh, there, people aren't going to go, hey, that's not the original guy. You look at how many Arthurs there have been. I think there have been eight Arthurs. Wow. Yeah. Um, now, I notice a lot of work is done in Vancouver these days, and a lot of work is done in Canada instead of the U.S. I guess this is probably a lot of reasons for that. How is sort of the Toronto voice acting industry doing uh, on a whole compared to other places? Doing extremely well. We are number one, absolutely number one in Canada. Certainly, commercially, we're miles ahead of anybody else. Look at the population, and it's the, um, Toronto is um, sort of the, 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 the well, I don't want to say it's the center of the universe, but everybody else in Canada will laugh at me, but certainly financially it's the center of Canada, um, and so and we have the most people, and this is where the market is for commercials. Uh, Animation-wise, we, we do, we're equally, we're one and one with, uh, with LA. At any given time, we could be more. There are probably 25 or more animated series going on in Toronto at any given time. That's a lot of work. Now, uh, now you do a lot of voice directing. Could you just tell me a bit about how that works? Um, do you like to get a lot of people sort of in the studio at the same talking to each other, same time talking to each other, or just one at a time, or what? That isn't done at all anymore. It's all one off. You come in. Uh, I uh, schedule uh, based on a performer's abilities. Uh, I, I know a novice is probably going to take more time to record uh, than a seasoned professional. Kids, you by and large, will take longer. So I draw up a schedule. I'm usually asked to draw up a time budgeting formats, formatted schedule that accommodates different performers. And uh, I do that. I get them in one at a time. 
uh, I have to know the whole script and how loud things are, how soft. The, 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 I have to know all the context of a script as a voice director because I'll record. Mom and Dad may talk together in many, many different scenes, but I may not get them in. They'll be in two days apart. I have to know exactly how Mom has delivered a line so that Dad can respond appropriately. And uh, if someone's yelling to their kids, if they're both yelling, mom and dad have to, have to yell pretty much at the same level. It's, uh, it requires work. It requires time. It's uh, laborious, but it's great fun. Um, dubbing for original English properties uh, versus anime, is there a big difference? You see you've done both? So. Um, yes, I have. Uh, anime, uh, of course, is primarily it's either Japanese and there's some Korean. You obviously can't match lips. Uh, exactly. Well, let me reverse that. English to English is tough. I do a show called, I voice direct a show called Mike the Knight. And the original production is British English. So aside from truck and lorry, or uh, a lock and a latch, and a few words like that that have to be adjusted, it has to, those lips have to match exactly. The Canadian performance has to match the lips exactly. With the anime, you're, it's, Bakugan and the new Beyblade, it's basically top and tail that have to match. Start at the right point, end at the right point. The, this, the original Beyblade, mm -hmm. was written in, uh, called a Rhythmo Band, where they really do try to match the lips so that someone talking, if you're watching my hand right now, they try to match it so that everything syncs. Like that. And it's done, that's because we they they hired people from Montreal. Montreal is the dubbing center of Canada, and there are people there very very adept at writing scripts because they're doing foreign language always usually English to French or French to English. They have they know what sounds uh, are, are produced by lips being in a certain position. It isn't always if you're saying mmm. Well, our lips are closed for a lot of different sounds. And so they write, their script writing is much closer. If you watch the original Beyblade, the lips are very close. You watch the new Beyblade, they're miles apart. And do people really seem to care if, if it matches very closely or not? I don't know if consciously they care, but I think that subconsciously something, obviously, uh, obviously there's something there. Uh, why do you like things? I mean, there's so many unconscious or subconscious things that affect a, uh, a listener or a viewer's perspective. That may be one of them. Uh, one more question. Uh, Vince Carrazzo was at Anime Revolution last week. He made an offhand comment at a panel when he was doing Sailor Moon, and he was in the third and fourth season that you were somewhat involved in, yeah. um, that sometimes he would do 15, 20 episodes at a time. Was he exaggerating, or is there possibly truth to that? There is some truth to that. I don't know if it was 15 or 20, but lots. You've got a character in, uh, especially when you, I mean, obviously we, when I'm either casting something or directing, I try to get in the most experienced people I can, if I can, and uh, if I, and, and the, the busy people are not always available. It's easy if the scripts are ready and the scripts are final, you got a performer in, all it means is changing, well at that time it meant changing the video or, or, uh, and then simply recording. Okay, you're done. You got to have 12 lines in this episode. Done. Let's go to the next one. Done. Here's the story outline. Da 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 da. As you know, that some lines in anime don't sound like they're contextually right. You get a weird little thing sometimes. That's simply because performers are sometimes thrown. I mean, a lot of times performers are delinquent and don't study their scripts enough. But sometimes they're simp they're th they're thrown lines or information with very little context. All right, cool. Well, thanks a lot for uh, joining us today. This is John Stalker at uh, Fan Expo. Thank you. And thank you. Good to talk with you. And you. Thank you for everything. There are still many things I wish to teach you, Chad. What's the big hurry? I just feel it's time to go. Travel mm. a bit, you know?
Well, send me a postcard from time to time, and take care. Uh, how do you do? Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mr. Magic Piero. Hmm. Beery, beery, ladies and gentlemen. Beery, beery, I'm the greatest entertainer to ever slither your way. I'm Beery, beery, the electric catfish. But that's not all. You can be sure I will shock you. Beery, beery. <laughs>